Okay, so welcome to episode number 10 already of uh, Coronavirus Conversations. It is already September 29th. I, I can't believe it. Um, we've been back on campus now for almost uh, seven full weeks. Um, time, is, time is flying by and we are still on campus, so yay. All right, so again, my name is Adam Hersberger. Um, I'm in the biology department here at Albright. And my partner in crime over here to my, on my screen, I guess this way, uh, Josh Williamson. Hi, Josh. Hi, Adam. How are you today? And how are things going in the Student Health Center these days? It's busy. It's a new challenge every day. Um, and, um, but like you said, we're on campus and, um, and we're moving along. So um, I'm excited to see um, that we've just about made it through the first block and uh, we're gonna head into the second block and hopefully have as much success as we did the first round. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. And we have um, a, another guest joining us today. Uh, and thanks to uh, Dr. Irene Langren. She is a professor of political science here at Albright College. So welcome, Irene. Thanks for having me. Okay. Uh, so yeah, so, so you're here for episode number 10. And so, so far, We've been, you know, having a biologist and a you know, medical doctor. Uh, last episode, we had a, a physicist. We've been a little heavy on the sort of uh, quote unquote hard science or the, you know, the natural science uh, sort of bent to things. So I thought it would be uh, great to have Irene today. Um, and so uh, she's also on the pandemic task force. So this is uh, sort of a mini meeting of the pandemic task force. Uh, I don't know if we, we certainly don't have quorum today, but uh, we. <laughs> We can discuss that if, um, if, you know, if you want. But yeah, so we're all in the pandemic task force. Um, and Irene, uh, I imagine, was recruited in some way because of her experience uh, as part of the public health program here at Albright. Uh, but before we get into that, um, uh, Irene, I just wanted you to, uh, so just for you know, the listeners slash uh, viewers around Albright's uh, community, uh, just a little bit about, about yourself. Uh, you know, uh, what, what, you know, what is your, you know, you have, where do you hail from? What is your, what is your training? What, what brought you to Albright? Well, I come from Pennsylvania and I have uh, worked with organizations on health issues actually in several countries, uh, Cambodia, uh, the Philippines, and I went to school in Canada. And I actually became interested in public health and politics back in the 1990s when I became involved uh, with another pandemic with HIV AIDS. And I was working on HIV AIDS education at another institution. And I was also volunteering for a local organization. And as I was doing that work, I started to become uh, more and more interested in exploring how politics and policy are impacting people's lives when we face these um, unanticipated uh, pandemics like HIV AIDS and actually like the current one. So I became interested and went on to graduate school for that. And I think the, the second big revelation to me was that everything is really based in health systems. Uh, it's how health systems are structured, how the healthcare system is structured, um, and that really shapes the response to pandemics. And so here we are. What was, your, what was your undergraduate degree in? It was in um, general, it was a general arts degree with minors in French and political science. Okay. It was, was this at a sort of a liberal arts uh, institution? It, it was at Villanova University. Okay. Okay. Right. And so, then I went on to University of Toronto. Gotcha. Okay. So you have, you had that sort of broad training and you sort of, and then, and then specialized. Okay. And so you went to graduate school in, in, in what uh, exact field would that be? In political science. In political science, right. Yeah. And so then, you, then you got your PhD in political science, right? Yes. Okay. Um, and then, so, so, so what did you, so did, did you focus specifically on pandemics for, say, your, like, dissertation? I actually started out, and I was planning to focus on HIV AIDS. Mm -hmm. But then when I arrived in the Philippines, I, I spent about eight months living in the Philippines doing research there. And when I arrived, a much bigger question seemed to be the health system itself. Okay. And at that point, they were in the process of decentralizing their health systems. And that meant that instead of having health planning occur in the capital of Manila, 
it was being um, dispersed to a lot of local governments all around the country. And that seemed to be what would really be shaping the response to issues like HIV AIDS, other pandemics, and, and the broader health issues that the country faced. Okay. Very interesting, okay. Um, and so then you, uh, so, so, what, so, so where did you go between say, uh, graduate school in Albright? Um, uh, I actually, I had a wonderful opportunity to work for a few nonprofit organizations including the Carter Center in Atlanta. Okay. Um, so I'll give a big shout out to the Carter Center. Uh, the Carter Center is a nonprofit organization in the U.S. They have programs that are de dedicated to uh, promoting peace, to fighting poverty, and also uh, to fighting disease. So the Carter Center has been working very hard to eradicate uh, guinea worm disease. Mm -hmm. Um, this is a neglected tropical disease that is debilitating and they actually have been, they are very, very close to eradicating this disease from the face of the earth. And if they're successful, it would be uh, the second disease following smallpox that we've been able to eradicate. Um, this is the organization that of course was founded by former U.S. President Jimmy Carter uh, and his wife Rosalind Carter. I've, I've heard about some of that work. Uh, yeah, it's very, it's very interesting. Um, yeah, the guinea worm thing, it's, it's so close. We were making strides also with polio. We were getting very close with that, and then we've kind of back, backslid on that, unfortunately, and the pandemic has only made that worse, is my understanding from what I've read, that, you know, vaccination efforts and public health uh, efforts in some of these nations have backslid with local conflicts, political issues, and now the pandemic. So, that's unfortunate because we were making really, really good progress on, on, on polio as well. So. Yeah, I've, I've been telling my students in global health for almost 15 years that we're really, really close to eradicating either polio, guinea worm, or both. And uh, we just haven't made it yet. And of course, we are seeing some backsliding uh, because of the current pandemic. It's, it's impacted all other health issues as well. Um, it's impacted vaccination efforts tremendously, even in this country, which was already facing right. a resurgence of measles. Um, so it's, it's, it's had a, a major impact on so many fronts. Right. Um, and yeah, Josh, I mean, I don't know if you want to weigh in on that. that. I was thinking that as Irene was talking, that's a very good point. Just in terms of um, like general care, right? Or, or if somebody has a chronic condition, uh, people putting off care, uh, or, or maintenance visits or, or, or diagnostic visits because of the pandemic. Uh, is, is that something that, that you've seen or talked about with, with, with your colleagues? Yes, I mean, they, um, the American Academy of Pediatrics is uh, putting on a big push. Um, they started, um, I think it's been maybe a month and a half ago, they, they started a push um, to try to get kids caught up on vaccinations um, because with all the, um, with all the preventative care, um, being pushed off during the height of the, the height of the pandemic, at least hopefully that was the height of the pandemic. <laughs> um, everything got pushed back, and so it is a it's a major concern. Uh, there's also a lot of um, a lot of uh, discussion in medical literature about um, oncology patients um, having to um, push back treatments, push back screening. So there's a big concern that that's going to be an, another another um, Part of the fallout from COVID, um, when when patients do start to catch catch up, that um, hopefully to, hopefully there's not too many patients that that were missed or or had care delayed. So it is a major concern. Yeah, I've I've, I've read that there will probably be a, a big spike over the course of this year in in, in uh, rates of mortality, not just due to COVID, but due to some of these other conditions that are either going un undiagnosed or, or or not treated properly. Yeah, there's been there's been some. It, it's funny how um, some of some of the information, um, you know, everybody's trying to change their their websites to to provide good information. But there, um, one of the sites I was on, I, I'm sorry, I can't reference it right now, but um, they had um, they had all all cause death compared um, this year compared to the years previous, um, and there was actually a drop in the United States um, recently. 
um, after it, would, it had been so much higher from years before. Um, but then again, whether or not we're going to see that number really increase um, afterwards is is the is the big question. Right. And people talk a lot about like you know herd immunity with this current pan, uh, pandemic. We don't know what that number is. We don't know what fraction of the population needs to either be infected or vaccinated to achieve herd immunity. Um, but I do know from the literature that, you know, um, I read on measles, that that is probably either the most contagious or one of the most contagious pathogens there is. And if rates of vaccination are not approaching about 95% or so, then that leaves pockets of the population susceptible to infection. And measles is, 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 is no joke. Um, we just did a paper in my, in, in my immunology class. Um, they, they did an analysis and measles can actually infect your B cells and kill your B cells. And so your antibody repertoire that you've developed over your life from your natural infections and from your vaccinations can be severely depleted. And so now you're susceptible to a lot of these pathogens that your immunity is essentially, um, they, they, they refer to it in the papers, um, immune amnesia, which is kind of, I, I kind of like that. Um, there's, but, but for, and, and it can last for, for years afterward where, where your immune response can be basically um, uh, depressed from the measles. So measles itself isn't necessarily lethal, but it can leave you susceptible to a lot of complications uh, afterward. Um, and, you know, when measles is circulating in high levels, rates of mortality go up from other causes. So measles is no joke, but you need to have high vaccination rates to achieve that and, 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 and to protect the vulnerable. Um, so it's really unfortunate to hear that about, about vaccination rates. Um, so anyway, so, so Irene, so, uh, so you're also in, uh, in charge of coordinating the public health program here um, at Albright. Um, can you tell us a little bit about, about that program and what students kind of do, what they kind of learn in, in that program? Sure, absolutely. Um, I'll, I'll first start out by just a, a quick definition of public health. Sure. Uh, public health really involves the measures that we take to promote health within communities, within populations. So what's important about public health is that it's, it's different from medicine. So for example, if, if I have a heart attack, I'm going to go see Josh, right? I'm going to get treated for that. That's medicine. But if I am interested in looking at a population and really um, promoting physical fitness, healthy, healthy diets, um, that would be more health promotion. That's more in the line of public health and, and what we do. Um, Albright has some absolutely fantastic and dedicated public health students. They do amazing work and several have been involved in a lot of the uh, pandemic planning on campus. Uh, and they, they've really uh, worked hard and, and made some important contributions to keeping everyone safe here. With public health, it's an interdisciplinary field. And, and that really means that we're, it draws upon the work of all these other disciplines. So of course, the natural sciences, uh, biology play really critical roles in helping us understand disease and illness. Uh, when we look at health policy, we draw, of course, on, on political science. Uh, we draw on philosophy for looking at questions about how to make decisions ethically. We certainly draw upon the work of history. And with history, we look really at even past pandemics and what they can teach us, what lessons they hold for us in dealing with present or future pandemics. Um, so Albright's program is set up to be a co-major. So you pair it with something else. Uh, we do require internships because it really is a field where it's important to get some hands-on experience. Mm -hmm. Obviously, this semester, a lot of our internships are remote, but we're still able to offer some great opportunities for our students. And, and the other thing I would say is we have a network of alumni who are working in this field for government uh, entities, they're working for businesses, they're working for nonprofits, and they, they help form a network uh, for our students to help guide them as they enter into careers in this field. 
Oh, very, very interesting. Do, do you have, um, sorry to put you on the spot, but do you have a couple of like recent examples of what a graduate has maybe gone on to do? Do you, do you have anything? Absolutely. Yeah. So I have, there's some graduates who are working in the field from even before we established this program. We do have one graduate who actually had an internship in Lancaster County and she was working on, um, on health promotion. Specifically, she was working at looking at uh, lead in the water. Okay. And she actually ended up going on and um, you know, getting a job in that field. We do have a fairly recent graduate who took some uh, public health courses who is working for the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in New York City. Cool. So, of course, that was a, a real hotbed um, of the pandemic, especially this spring. Um, so we have, we have people who have been working. We have a former uh, student, actually, who graduated a while ago. And he is retired now, but he was an epidemiologist at Yale um, for many, many years and is an expert in, in this field. So we have a lot of interesting examples of um of students who have gone on to do great work in this field yeah and it's, it's a relatively new new co-major right we're, it's it is it's just now. a few years old yeah. so we're we're growing right exactly yeah that's very very cool so and, and this is something that's on 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 people's minds um with the current pandemic you, you, there's daily briefings uh and and you know press conferences so when 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 you hear somebody from say the the state or the local say public health office right or or the agency like like what what does that mean exactly and and who works for those agencies and josh and josh you could you could probably jump in as well because i honestly have no idea in terms of who works at the national level right well, well even, even local I'm, I'm just asking very like generally like because because you hear like i said these news releases or press releases governor wolf might be talking about you know, the, 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 this public health agency or this public health official. And, and I honestly have no idea, like, if, if they're elected or not elected, appointed, like, like what their training is, like, who are these people? Like, I have no idea. And I'm sure, you know, I'm sure some of our listeners might, might want to know as well. So Their training can actually vary quite a bit because, uh, as, as I just mentioned, public health is an interdisciplinary field. So you will have people who have a background, for example, even in economics, who will be health economists, who will be able to look and, and compare the um, cost-benefit ratios of different health interventions. Uh, you have people who may be trained in the medical field or biologists. You also have people who uh, come from psychology or um, e even political science, um, sociology, um, marketing communications who can work on how to get those messages out effectively. Um, if you look at the structure of the public health system in the United States, the health system itself is one that is not coordinated to a large degree on the national level. So I think, and, and Josh, you might be able to speak to this even more, if you look at much of the work that's been done in this country, we've seen state and local governments often taking the lead. Um, yeah, Irene, I will jump in with that because uh, I, I've never had to think too much about um, the public health system, to be honest. Uh, you know, we, we certainly um, utilize their resources for certain things, but it's never been um, to the forefront the way it is right now. Um, so, um, I can give a, a quick example. In, in Pennsylvania, it's up to the, to the local governments as to whether or not they're going to have um, a, a county health department. Um, and so, um, honestly, I, uh, until this year, I didn't understand why when I would look up, um, uh, try to find um, phone numbers and, and contacts for our local health department, um, I, I couldn't understand why it was so easy to find Montgomery County, for example, and Philadelphia County. Um, and in Berks County, um, it seemed very um, unclear, I guess is the way to say that. Um, and then um, 
And then in addition to that, what I've learned is that um, a lot of private agencies um, are contracted to do work for, um, for the health department. Um, for example, in Berks County, um, Co County Wellness um, is doing contact tracing for, um, for the health department for Berks County. Um, and, and so, um, like Irene said, the, the states, not only do the states um, uh, set up their system, but then the local governments um, can vary dr pretty dramatically when you say Irene. Uh, I, I would. And you see that um, you've had actually even disputes in some states between what the state wants to do and what the local governments want to do. One may be more conservative than the other, and then they battle it out. Um, and, and we have had less of an emphasis on national mandates coming from Washington, D.C. So we we do have that tension. And that's something that is, is unique. If you look at industrialized democracies, there tends to be more of a system in place. Uh, the US is the only industrialized democracy uh, without, it is the only one that does not have universal health insurance, uh, universal coverage. So with that, we see that the health system is actually a mix of public and private providers. Uh, that with great variations by locality. So it's very much like de decentralized, and I guess that can vary substantially in, in terms of the response, right? It can. I yeah. mean, it, it's the, the term for it is the U.S. health system is pluralistic. Okay. Um, so, so I think it would be really fascinating after this to do some country, some cross-country comparisons in terms of effectiveness in dealing with this pandemic. Uh, is it more effective to have a nationalized system? Is it more effective if you have a county that has an established health department versus one that does not? And of course, leadership plays in to all of that as well. That's another variable. So I think political scientists are gonna um, have a lot of work to do <laughs> after this pandemic. Isn't it amazing how much there's going to be so much information to plow through and then it's going to be hard to decipher what how you know how everybody comes to their conclusions. Um, it'll be interesting to see. Absolutely. So, so Irene, um, maybe you'll know the answer to this in, like under current law and let's just stick with Pennsylvania because that's where we you know live with, with current laws like how much say quote unquote power does, a, does a, a health department have, right? If there's some sort of outbreak, you know what I mean? Like, like do you happen to have any insight on that? In terms, there are some powers that are even at the federal level in terms of quarantine, right? Okay. Um, there are some powers that local governments can have, but, but here's the issue. We've seen court cases when you've had disputes between, for example, the mayor of Atlanta mm -hmm. and the governor of Georgia. Right? So often this area is not as, as clear cut as you think it might be in terms of state power or local power to mandate wearing of masks or to shut down schools. So what we have seen, we've even seen it in Florida, for example, where we've seen local officials who would like to have more stringent restrictions in place being challenged by governors. Um, so this is still working its way through courts in, in several states. Okay. I would anticipate that one of the outcomes of this pandemic would be more clear guidelines on the roles and powers of local governments and, and state governments to enact these restrictions. Right. You, you know, because you know, I imagine, I mean, just from watching TV shows and watching the news. I mean, if there's say a restaurant that has health code violations, I mean, that can be shut down, right? By the, by the local like health agency uh, until it's remedied. But I just find the response to this pandemic to be so interesting and sporadic. And it's, it's frankly frustrating because I mean, Lowe's, for example, you go to Lowe's, you go to the grocery store, you know, must wear a mask. But what, what recourse does anyone really have to like enforce that? Um, you know, I mean, do, you know, can, can, can local police find someone? I, I don't think so, right? I mean, so 
where, where, where's the enforcement part of all of these pandemic response measures? I, I don't know. Yeah, and, and is there a willingness to enforce them? Um, yeah. Because that's, you know, th there's a risk too. You, when you try to enforce some of these measures, there, there can be a risk to the person who is trying to enforce them. And we've certainly seen that with people who are working in different businesses who have to ask customers to, to wear masks. Um, you know, when do you call the authorities? Are the authorities, what are they willing right. to do? And will they be backed by uh, local politicians as well? So again, the U.S. health system is, is pluralistic. So it's just this combination of, you know, state and local uh, actions with public and private actors involved. So it is, it is not uh, terribly coordinated. And I think there's been a a little bit of a reluctance to have more of a national role with this uh, pandemic in coordinating uh, a, a national response. I think there's also some, you know, there's always um, in the United States, there's always the question of insurance coverage in certain circumstances as well. So um, I, I know that in a lot of discussions I've had um, at the, organizational level the question is uh, what does your insurance carrier say because that's a, um, a a major determinant as to how much risk um, an, an organization has yeah i think that's the big elephant in the room uh looking at health insurance uh, in, in this country because you know with the u.s being the only industrialized democracy without universal coverage it does mean that there are, people, there are people who may not seek care if they suspect that they are ill. Um, we also are, are facing potentially, even you know, in a matter of weeks, the loss of the Affordable Care Act, which of course will be going to the Supreme Court. Probably they'll, they'll start hearing arguments about a week after the presidential election. That's going to be important to this whole discussion as well, because of course the Affordable Care Act uh, mandates that you have to have protections for people with pre-existing conditions. That's about half the population in the United States. Um, you also have the potential that there could be and, and, you know, Josh and Adam, you could speak to this. There could be long-term repercussions for people who have had COVID-19. Mm -hmm. um, there could be long-term health concerns. So if you have uh, potentially millions of people losing their health insurance, uh, what are the repercussions that come from this pandemic? So that's, that's another thing that, that I'm sure is, is on people's minds. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, so when we, when we were chatting earlier, you said you had you wanted to give a little information on the on the WHO. Um, could, could you because they they've taken a big role um, in this, right? Especially early on. So could you give a little insight onto what what is the World Health Organization? Sure. Uh, the World Health Organization was founded in 1948. It is uh, an organization whose members are countries, governments. So there are 194 members now. Uh, the U.S. is leaving the World Health Organization and, and also um, taking funding, its funding with it, really over, um, over concerns that the World Health Organization did not respond quickly enough to this pandemic, uh, that it was too def deferential to the Chinese government in terms of responding. Um, that of course, you know, leaves a, a vacuum. We know now, you know, we are uh, increasingly interconnected. We lived in, in a, we live in a globalized environment. So we know that when there are diseases in one part of the world, um, they can very quickly go from being an epidemic to a pandemic. And, and this is what we've seen, and we are going to continue to see this. This won't be the last pandemic uh, that we see. So the question is, how do you, how do you coordinate 
the response to that. Um, it's a global problem. It's a transnational problem. It's a problem that crosses borders. So how do you get an institution in which states can work together to try to address these concerns uh, when they arise? And, and so the World Health Organization um, does play that role, um, but it's one where there has been a lot of uh, criticism of it, uh, especially from the Trump administration. So and the question, the ability of the World Health Organization to respond to future pandemics is really going to rest upon the willingness of states, of, of governments to become involved and uh, work with it to improve the, the mechanisms uh, for dealing with these crises. Josh, did you have any like sort of uh, insight or questions on that? Um, no, I think, uh, um, I think the World Health Organization plays a crucial role um, and especially trying to allocate resources to countries that need it. Um, there's, you know, it, it is, it's very sad that um, you know that our our world still has places um, with with such limited care um, for their people. So uh, there's just no other way for um, for those for those people to get to get help unless um, unless those of us that um, that enjoy all these resources are, are willing to share it. Um, and then the hard part, you know. Our next uh, big hurdle with this is once a once a vaccine is available, where is it going to go? You know, um, and uh, you know this that's going to be no small feat um, distributing a, a vaccine across the across the globe all at once. <laughs> um, and and so those are those are big ethical questions. I'm I'm sure that's a a great public health topic. <laughs> I read is what's going to happen when the vaccine does become available. Where is it going to go? How's it going to get to those places? And without the World Health Organization, it never would. And so the WHO are they? Are they? Are they so they have resources and they can help with like local efforts. So can they distribute like medical like um, supplies or, or you know are we talking things like that? Where they they also take part in vaccination campaigns, correct? Yes, they, they do. And there's actually a global alliance that works with the World Health Organization and UNICEF and a, a, okay. the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And there's a global effort, you know, with the World Health Organization to work on, on vaccinations. But um, Josh, you're right. It's going to be very complex to even get a vaccination program rolled out in this country. When you think about doing it on a global basis, you are looking at, at parts of the world where there is very little infrastructure for health, where there may not be people who are trained, medically trained health professionals for, for a very um, large geographic region. You're looking at areas that may be engulfed in conflict, uh, that, that may have populations that are, are not necessarily staying in one place. Uh, you'll have internally displaced people, you'll have refugees. So it, it's going to be really complex. But if we don't get this right, it's the impact is going to come back and it's going to be felt in the United States, in Pennsylvania, and in Reading. It's what happens in the rest of the world matters to to us and our own lives. We are so interconnected as, as a world. Um, so we, we have to be able to get this right. We have to make sure that we are able to get a vaccination to populations all over the world. And, and it's, it's doable, but it's gonna, take, it's gonna take leadership and it's gonna take resources. Yeah, I'm still amazed at, and you, you speak about, about the interconnectedness, and it's, I'm still amazed at how quickly this virus spread around the world. I mean, with, with our increased population density and, and, and the ease of world travel, I, I, I guess maybe I shouldn't be amazed, but I'm, I was still amazed at how quickly it started from a small little epicenter somewhere in you know, China to literally globally. Um, it's, it's amazing. Um, and you know, the economic impact of all this, 
you know, kids with school and jobs and everything else, like you're right. I mean, we need to try, try to coordinate. If, if we can find a good safe vaccine, which I think we will, trying to coordinate and getting it out as quickly as the virus spread <laughs> yeah, is gonna be a challenge. Uh, I, you know, you, you were speaking of polling earlier, Irene, when we were doing our little pre-show thing. Um, maybe you want to bring that up, but I'm amazed at, um, at some of the polling I've seen, frankly. Um, I c consider myself, you know, I'm, I'm not a conspiracy theorist or anything like that. Um, you know, these, these companies, as far as I can tell, are following all protocol. It just, it's just a little bit accelerated, right, relative to what we're used to. But they're still monitoring vaccine safety. They're, they're still doing everything that they would normally do for support for safety as as well as um, effectiveness you know um, I mean I will certainly get the vaccine whenever it becomes available um, and I you know I think you know I'm, 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 I'm not skeptical um, but some of these polls I've seen like upwards of 40 50 percent in some states of people uh, are, are saying they're not going to get it and I I don't know do you have any insight on on you know I'm into that or I, I think there's a, a lack of faith um, in, in a lot of the public health messaging that we are seeing and a lot of the messaging we are, are seeing um, in, in this country. I, I think this problem goes back even further. Um, we've seen a real decline in this country and actually globally in terms of measles vaccinations. And uh, that's really been largely based on myths, things that are, are untrue. Um, there's there's a, a myth that is out there that the measles vaccine causes autism, and, and it does not. Uh, the person who wrote that study, Dr. Andrew Wakefield, had his medical license revoked because it, it was not a valid study. Um, the study was retracted from the British journal, The Lancet, um, but we still see those repercussions. So it, it's being able to have people have faith in science. And that is why with public health, we need those people who are specialists in marketing and in communications and who can work on getting that message out. Um, so I think, I think those are all important things to consider. And if we're gonna be effective, with vaccination rates, um, we need to look at how we market this. Yeah, it does concern me too. There's a, a big concern that if it's not done right, that it, it will be detrimental to, to vaccination rates. So that's another big concern I have because it is an everyday battle. <clears throat> Fighting these myths that I, I, I re mentioned, probably the biggest one. Um, I always tell parents, you know, at one of the when parents are trying to decide whether to vaccinate their child, I, I tell them, you know, um, it's the great success that vaccination has had that leads us to believe that it's not necessary anymore. Um, you know, when, 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 we, when we don't have a personal connection with people that have, um, that have lost their lives or have had um, a difficult uh, course uh, struggling against a vaccine preventable disease, it leads you to feel like that it's not necessary. And so, and then as we get better and better and pick off um, diseases that are less noticeable, like, um, uh, like HPV and, and, and meningitis um, and hepatitis A, it, it, it makes people wonder why we're doing that. <laughs> and these are major public health issues, but on a personal level, you're unlikely to know somebody that had one of those conditions. And then it makes you, <clears throat> it makes you susceptible to the, um, uh, to the propaganda on the other side, the conspiracy theories and all those types of things. Um, so I, I hope that we can make this work well. I, I do worry because as these as new vaccinations have hit the U.S. market, there's there's delays in production. There's um, there's um, you know holds when there's concerns, which are, are are correct. You know when there's a concern that maybe there's an increase, an uptick in in rare diseases that maybe that it came from a vaccine, and they look at it very thoroughly. Um, but that sometimes puts a hold on um, on a product, uh, or the manufacturing delays puts a hold on the product, and then uh, and then you can't you can't put it out, and and then that's I think also um, um, lowers the public trust in in, in in the program in general. 
Yeah, yeah that's, that's a good point. Yeah, that, that, that's something that comes up all the time, Josh, like in my, in, in my micro class or immunology, we, when we talk about this, we, we bring up and we discuss how vaccines have almost become their own worst enemy. They're so good, <laughs> right? That you're right. I mean, I was reading um, once that, you know, you know, of course, families are smaller now than they used to be. When we were a little more, you know, spread out and a little more rural and more like agrarian, like, I think it was commonplace to have maybe six to 10 kids, right? Or, you know, very, very large families. And I was reading that it was, it was very common that you, that, that a parent would, would not only have a child come down with one of these illnesses, but, but die from one of these illnesses, whether it's pertussis or scarlet fever, whatever it might be. You, as a parent, you, you could expect to have to one of your six or eight kids die from some illness. Um, and, and now it's just, it's just not a thing anymore. Luckily for us in this country and other countries, um, and, and, and so I think you hit the nail on the head there. Uh, we're becoming very risk averse. And whether you're talking about taking a blood pressure medication or a vaccine or anything, because we're so diverse as a population, you could have a negative reaction. Somebody out there could have a negative reaction to anything. You could give them a sugar pill, who, right? Who knows? I mean, I mean, there's so many things that can happen. Um, and so and there's never going to be anything that's hundred percent safe. It's just not going to happen. Um, and that's, you know, to, to go off on a just a tiny bit of a side note, we, we also talk about genetically modified organisms in, in some of my courses. <clears throat> like when I, when, when I talk about genetics and people have a, some people have a natural like sort of distrust of, of, of any genetically modified food, even though they can be potentially advantageous for crop yield and feeding people or increasing, you know, nutrient profile in a food. And, uh, and, and, and again, there's no way to prove that this, say, genetically modified apple or rice, or whatever it is, is 100% safe. You could give it to 6 million people and there's no adverse reaction, but somebody could always come back and say, but if you gave it to 6 million more, you might come up with something, you know? And that's the battle that we're kind of facing. Yeah, I, I, I like that point, Adam. And I, and, and I like to tell people, you know, we, when was the last time we had a famine? <laughs> And I think some of the things we're doing with some of our um, our agricultural um, uh, it, it, agriculture is is working pretty well. Um, and and not again, not to say that that bad things can't happen, but uh, but some things we've been doing um, is working is working in that regard. Um, there was an interesting quote, I, and I mean, maybe you can correct me if you know this one, but I I, I think it was Ben Franklin. Um, um, lost a child to smallpox, and um, he said one of his one of his regrets in life was to lose a, a fine young boy uh, to a disease that could have been prevented with inoculation. Um, and those are kind of those are the stories you don't really hear. You know, there's a lot of people that talk about how this vaccine caused a problem, but you know, as a parent, if if your child um, had you know, a, a horrible illness that could have been prevented, you know, you're really less likely to, you know, to have that be, um, um, have that news be spread to, um, to the public, you know, and that's just human nature. Yeah, and unfortunately that, yeah, unfortunately we don't, we, we don't hear that, right? Like if people wear masks and it's preventing transmission, you, there, there's no transmission, there's nothing to report, right? right. It's, it's the same thing, you know? Yeah. So, Irene, did, was there, was there, we, we saw a little bit of time, um, was there anything else that, that you kind of wanted to bring up, given your specialty that we haven't maybe hit on today? Oh boy, we've, we've touched upon a lot, but there is so much more um, we, we can talk about. Um, I'll talk a little bit, just for a couple minutes, about some, some areas of up and coming research in this field. Um, there's a, a really, interesting um, subfield in the social sciences sciences when you have uh, futurists who are doing work on trying to predict what the world is going to be like after you know after major events or crises so there's some really interesting work that's being done right now in terms of the long-term political social and economic impact of, of the pandemic and how we can really use this experience to hopefully plan to respond more effectively in the future. 
So I, I think what we need to think about is what are the lessons that we are learning right now? Um, the other thing, I just want to give a shout out to uh, all the Albrightians who are on campus and wearing masks and doing such a good job at, at social distancing because uh, I was not sure how long we would manage to, to stay open with all of this. Uh, so, so to all those Albrightians who are working so hard um, with these restrictions, uh, I, I would just say, you know, send out my, my thanks for all their hard work. And Adam and Josh, I, I want to thank you for holding these conversations because with newly emerging diseases, we are learning things every week. And there is a lot of information coming out. I mean, we didn't even have a name for this disease when the spring semester started last year. And now we have a name for it. We know more, but we're learning more every day. So um, I wanted to thank the two of you for trying to sort some of that out for us and, and explain it in a way that, that makes it easier to understand. Well, you're welcome and thank you. Um, yeah, so, so if we get, if we, uh, get some follow-up uh, emails from, you know, questions and comments from, from the community um, related to this, because this is certainly, there's some very interesting things that we didn't even touch on today because we don't have time. Uh, so if, if there's some follow-up from the community and some comments, we'll, we'll may, maybe have you back on for a follow-up episode. Um, but there's certainly a lot of hot button issues surrounding a lot of this, so. <laughs> um, Anyway, well, well, thank you, Irene, for uh, you know for joining us today. And um, Josh, did you did you want to have any? Uh, this, you know, the floor is yours. Did you have any last comments for today's episode? No, I think I, I, Irene hit it um, hit the nail on the head for me. Um, our our students and our staff um, working hard, and it, they it's easy to get tired of it. It's easy to, to think that, okay, I haven't gotten it this, at this point, I'm not gonna worry about it anymore. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna jump back into to my normal life and, and we're just not ready for that. Um, and thankfully, um, the majority of, by far the majority of our students obviously um, are, are taking their responsibilities seriously. Um, yeah, so. Alrighty, so 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 let's yeah. So hopefully we will continue to be vigilant and um, and persevere, and uh, hopefully we continue to be on campus and we can get make it to at least Thanksgiving, right? We got to make the Thanksgiving, and then we have a a little while where, where we're going to be online. We have a we have our online interim session, and um, that's peak flu season and things like that. So that's the whole rationale for coming back uh, what early February. Um, so yeah, so we'll so we'll see what happens, but we're. We're going to keep doing what we can do. All right. Well, this concludes episode 10. Uh, thank you, Josh. Thank you, Irene. And um, like I said, if you have any questions, uh, please email um, um, any of us and, and, and we can try to address that on a future episode. Uh, so thank you very much. Take care, everybody. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.